Hey, Andrew, nice to meet Hello. you. Hello, nice to see you again. Nice to see you and hear you. Uh, it means that internet is okay. Uh, thanks uh, to Satoshi. Uh, we're welcoming you in uh, Encrypted Online Marathon, uh, hoping to, to hear some uh, good news from you. So uh, if you have presentation, please uh, share it with us. I will uh, give it on. Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for inviting. It is my real pleasure to be here. Just to you know, give you a short, uh, you know, heads up of what uh, we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about bridging. Why bridging is important in general, and how bridges can potentially help in uh, situations when you need to donate money, donate crypto in humanitarian events. It would be part of the topic to discuss, and then we will have some questions, hopefully or not. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay, I can't see you now, but just say okay if you see the screen okay. Everything is okay. Uh, the audience is yours. Please welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, I'm Andre. I'm co-founder of Oldbridge.io. And uh, I, as already mentioned, uh, today I want to discuss how we can use bridges to various purposes and why bridges are important in general. Uh, this is what I want to start with. Uh, so why do we need uh, the bridges in the first place? Now, we live today in multi-chain world. We see a lot of new blockchains emerging each and every day. And we need a method to transfer assets between one blockchain and the other one, essentially enabling users to come in and experience advantages and disadvantages of different protocols. And to do that, Usually there is an official bridge to the blockchain because it is essential part of infrastructure. If you are building, let's say, a city somewhere on the river, you need a bridge so people can come to the city and outside of the city. So this is one part of the problem. Uh, or, I, I mean, not the problem, actually. It is one part of why we need the bridges. Second one is, as I already mentioned, we live in a multi-chain world today and users want to benefit from all the chains that they have the access to, not specifically focusing on just one. I know that Bitcoin Maxis would probably hate me for that. I know that some of them are right now in Prague or Amsterdam, but uh, we have to acknowledge that different blockchains, they do indeed have different advantages. And if we want to make the most out of the market, especially in tough times like today, I think uh, we all saw the flash crash in the night. We need not just focus on something that is one thing, but we need to explore different opportunities. And that also means building the applications on top of the bridges that allow people to easily cross from one chain to the other. Last but not least, I would like to mention that there are liquidity farming opportunities because some people do come to crypto to earn some money. And some protocols do incentivize people if they move liquidity here and there between the chains, between the using different bridges, using different methods. So bridges can be a good tool there too. Uh, why I am personally talking about this? Uh, this is you know a good question. I do have a lot of expertise in building bridges. We launched our first bridge on mainnet in July 2021, and we transferred. I think it is quite an impressive amount of 6.4 billion worth of USDT combined. I'm calculating on the average price, but just so you get the idea. Today, our bridge integrated with 19 different chains, which I think it is also quite a cool number. And we specialize in integrations of EVM chains with non-EVM chains. Since 2022, we have been also working on cross-chain uh, stable swaps, and I will come into that topic just a bit later. Why do we need them and how bridges are evolving? If we think about the origins of the bridging market, in the beginning, bridges were mint and burn. That means that you deposit an asset on one chain, on, on the destination chain, you receive sort of an IOU, um, wrapped asset, how it is called, which means that this asset out there, 
it grants you the right to cross the bridge in backwards. So you enter the chain, you get this asset, you play with it if you have the uh, liquidity there. And then if you want to go back, you can go back by burning this asset and retrieving your original asset. This architecture was good at that time. And it also enabled the transfers of large liquidity volumes because Bridge basically prints this new asset on the destination chain. But the problem here that I would like to speak about is that this generation of the bridges, which have been on the market for quite some time, they sort of each and every bridge creates its own asset. And that creates this problem, which we call liquidity fractionalization. That means that if, for example, you use our bridge, old bridge, which we call classic, to transfer your USDC to Solana from Ethereum, you will get this USDC on Solana, which is old bridge USDC. If you use portal bridge by wormhole, you will have portal wormhole USDC, and the smart contract would be different. And then when Circle comes and issues a native smart contract on Solana, it is third contract. And all those three USDCs, which are supposed to be the same from the logical perspective, they're actually different from the technology perspective. And that leads to the user confusion. So what we started focusing on is that we need to improve the user experience. Because we, back in the days when the market was booming and the APYs were super high and people could earn a lot of money, let's say 100 plus percent on their stable coins just by entering new ecosystem, people were eager to explore how that was working back in the days. Depositing an asset on one side, then thinking about guest token that needs to finalize the transaction on the other side, then swapping the wrapped asset to the native asset using some extra protocols. And just because the reward was so huge, users were doing that. Now, when we are in times of downtrend, we cannot find such impressive APYs on the market. And that means that if we don't provide simple solutions for the users, they will not use the product at all. So this is what I'm saying here, that we need to find a way to make sure that for users, the transfer is seamless, does not require any extra steps or any specific knowledge. What are the ways to build better bridges? So first of all, this is what we call native cross-chain transfers. So that means that if you are transferring USDC from Ethereum to Solana, in my example, that means that in the end of the day, users should receive the real, the native USDC, not some wrapped asset. So that is why I'm speaking about cross-chain stable swaps. Why we are specifically targeting stable coins is that uh, over our experience, we figured out that for users, it is easier to transfer liquidity between the chains if they are operating with stable coins. It is easier to understand you've got, let's say, $100 here, you got $100 there. That is it. So you know the specific value that you are expecting to get. Second part, which is also important, is that we should aim to create a one-click solution, not like requiring users 10 different integrations, accepting the transaction, sending the transactions, receiving, converting. It should really be simple. Then messaging protocols, which is underlying technology for the bridges, which you could think of, it's like TCP IP for the internet. They are also various solutions on the market. And some of them are targeting just some chains, but not the other ones. We think, I personally think, that it is better to build the protocols which can utilize all the messaging protocols instead of focusing on just one. Then extra gas deposits, it is also an interesting thing because whenever you're coming to another chain for the first time, chances are that you don't have the gas token there. So you are not able to finalize the transaction. If the bridge even finalizes the transaction for you, you will still need to somehow find the gas to do the later transactions. 
because you don't want just to deposit the funds on your wallet. You want to play with those funds later on. And usually you need gas for that. And last but not least, it is bridging beyond TVNs because I think that today 90% of the bridges on the market, they're targeting just the EVM chains, which is understandable from the technology perspective that it is basically the same uh, Solidity smart contract that you deploy here and there, and you don't need to think of other technology issues. But I think that it is important to understand that there are not only EVM chains out there, and the users need connection to those chains. This is why we are focusing specifically on connecting EVM chains to non-EVM chains, because a lot of other bridges are simply not doing that. How can we use the bridges for humanitarian causes? Now, uh, I've been recently in Austin uh, for consensus, and there we had this panel about donations in crypto. And there, there's been an important point being raised uh, that, for example, in Belarus, Belarus, uh, people who were donating to the opposition or, for example, to Ukraine, at some point, they were using the centralized exchanges to make the transfers. And at some point, government demanded that the exchanges should leak this data to the authorities. And a lot of good people were arrested for just the fact that they were donating, which is, I think, it's uh, unacceptable. I'm not a big fan of centralized exchanges at all, but I'm here talking about this specific case. So if we are donating using the centralized exchanges, we should be aware of the risks associated with that. Because centralized exchanges, they obviously ask us to KYC ourselves. And that means that at any single moment, the data can be transferred and used against the people who are donating. Now, if we are speaking about solutions without uh, centralized exchanges and solutions where we need certain level of privacy for the good cause, then we can take a look at the mixers. But here is another problem. Whenever you're using a mixer just for a good reason and like donating, you're still using a mixer. And in all analytics data software, this transaction is going to be marked as the one coming from the mixer. And for a lot of people, that can be a problem, even for those who are accepting the funds. Because if they want to accept the funds, take them to an exchange to make withdrawal, uh, cash uh, transaction withdrawal, and the funds are coming from the mixer, the exchange can obviously block those funds. And I think that bridges here, it could be a potentially clever way to get past this problem. So let's say... Uh, in our market, the majority of people, the majority of OTC desks, which are helping people to get from their cash to crypto and backwards, they're using USDT on Tron. And uh, if we think that people are, for example, sending the funds on Ethereum in the form of USDC, and those funds go through the bridges, through cross-chain stable swaps, get converted to USDT on Tron, it is way more difficult to trace this transaction back. It is still possible, but here it does not look like the mixing transaction and you need specific level of uh, technology knowledge to understand that there are messaging protocols where you can look into, you can uh, see there those transactions. And I think at this point of the market, more most people, they don't really care about that, uh, to look that deep into the tech. So I do think that bridges could potentially good, a good tool for privacy transfers at that point. Then another thing, and that again is coming back to the USDT on Tron, which is heavily used in Odyssey desks, is that whenever the funds are being donated, uh, those funds should go, you know, to fund the basic needs like buying food, clothes, uh, medicine, armor plates, and uh, not everyone will accept, uh, obviously, crypto there. So the majority of people would still need to use the OTC desk to transfer from crypto into the cash to do the, to finalize the purchase. And at the same time, there are huge communities out there that are not really using USDT on Tron. So what bridges can do here, they can share this valuable tool, as I think of it, that people are donating in the currency that they want, but the receivers get the currency that they need. And Bridges sort of uh, 
Khan is the middleman enabling this whole process. And this is another use case which I am potentially really fond of. What is next for cross-chain bridges? I think that uh, I'm saying here on this slide that bridges will become a foundational layer for DeFi products, but I think they already did. It is the infrastructure layer which people are building on. Uh, but what is important here is that I think that people will start slowly moving from the bridges UI to more like under the hood integrations and using the dApps that they want. So whenever someone is making a bridge transfer, I don't think that the end point here is to make the bridge transfer. The end point here is to make use of some sort of protocol on destination chain. And I think that from the user experience, it is way more convenient to, instead of going to bridge UI, sending the funds, then going to protocol, connecting there with the wallet, is simply using the protocol with this integration already enabled. And I think this is where the market is shifting into right now. And I think it is like this, if you are traveling in a car with your family from one part of Kiev to another, and you are crossing the bridge, you don't really care about who built this bridge. You just go want to go to visit your friends or you want to go visit your family. It is not about the infrastructure. It is more about the utility. So that is why I think that in the future, we will start slowly see bridges UIs fading out and more people just using the protocols, not even be aware that they are using some of the bridges under the hood. Uh, so to do that, it is important to build nice SDKs. It is important to work with aggregators. It is important to think about how easy for the protocol is to do this bridge integration. And uh, our end goal for everyone operating in this ecosystem is to make life of our users better. And to do that, we need to simplify it as much as possible. And because of that, I think that focusing on that sort of integrations, it is something that we really need to think about. I think that uh, that mostly covers everything that I wanted to share with you today. So I specifically left some time for the questions. So I will stop uh, sharing my screen right now and you tell me if you have any questions at the point. I think you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, Thank you for, for your presentation. It's really beautiful in the colors of Encrypted Conference 2023. It's just perfect. We, we should here say thanks to our designer, Rami, who put a lot of time and effort into making this happen. Thank you, Rami, if you're watching us. Uh, really, uh, I had uh, questions, but uh, during your presentation, I, I got answers on these questions, and it's cool because uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, like, bridges are used mostly by tech savvy people and uh, how to make them uh, to be used wholesale and you told about uh, the under the hood uh, solutions and it's okay it's understandable that uh, if i will not even understand that i'm using cross chain it'll be it'll be great and it will help to 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 bring mass adoption to that uh, so uh, i'd like to 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 ask uh, the question which we ask all the speakers like, uh, what do you think can boost Web3 in Ukraine? Uh, there is a nice uh, mm, joke uh, that uh, the IT, uh, at some time it was like, really popular in the circles, I mean, that the IT has been developing so efficient in Ukraine thanks to the Ministry of IT. And then people say, like, wait, we do not have the Ministry of the AT. And I say, yeah, exactly. that's the point. That's <laughs> the point. Uh, so I think that to Ukraine is already, it's a beautiful place. A lot of super cool projects emerge from Ukraine. And over time, I came to crypto just for, you know, your interest in 2015. So I've seen a lot of things on the market. And back in the days, there were a, a lot of good developers in Ukraine which were working for companies, for Western companies, and probably they were unknown as the people, as the developers. 
Now, over time, in Ukraine, we have seen that uh, some products have started emerging. So we are not like outsourcing other guys. We're building things that are known worldwide. And it is super cool. It is really an evolution. This is something that we want because we already know that we have good scientific knowledge, that we've got nice technical expertise, nice technical education. And now we are entering the market. We have already been through the past few years by building products. And it is cool. And one of the reasons why it has became so popular, it is the, and so efficient, it is the lack of regulations. So people were basically allowed to do what they want to do without any guys in the suits telling them, here you can do that, here you need a license, blah, 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 this sort of shit. Sorry. Uh, I'm not a big fan of all those laws trying to regulate crypto in Ukraine because I think they will slow down the development. So the best way to answer your question, what can we do to boost the Web3 uh, tech and crypto in particular in Ukraine is just stay the, away from that. Just don't touch them. Let people do their job. Let people work. Let people think. Imagine new beautiful things. Just don't you know, try to put them into that cage with all the regulations. Because once you do that, then I think this market would be done for good and people will just find another place to stay. But don't you think that uh, this will, uh, okay, this will let people do what they want to do. They will create great projects, uh, great companies, but they will be registered not in Ukraine. Uh, they will be registered in Estonia, in uh, some uh, Malta and other countries. And, Singapore. Uh, Singapore, yeah, and uh, no taxes in Ukraine. Okay, uh, I I don't know where the taxes going, but okay, taxes in Ukraine, no. Uh, and the we we were talking with some previous speakers about uh, that funds and accelerators which can boost startup culture in Ukraine will never come in Ukraine. They will take uh, developers, they will take uh, specialists from Ukraine, but not come to Ukraine. Is it uh, a problem on your point of view? Uh -huh. I think that is entirely untrue. I know a lot of accelerators actively working with Ukraine. And I think that the fact that the people who live in Ukraine get their business incorporated someplace elsewhere, it is not a big deal. People still earn money in Ukraine. People still spend money in Ukraine. And it's not only about Web3, it's about the whole IT thing in general. I think that one of the things that our developers became so well-known worldwide was this individual uh, taxation. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how this should be translated into English, but I think you all know what I'm speaking about. FOPS, where you just pay the 5% and the companies that were structuring their business the way that the employees were like individual contractors paying those 5%, that made them efficient. When the capital wants to invest, when the companies are willing to hire people, when the companies are being built, they need to find a way to minimize their costs. And uh, it is like two sides, uh, two questions. Like, is the person a qualified expert? And how efficient is the person from the cost perspective? And if the answer to those two questions is positive, that means that the person is being employed. If not, that means that the company will start looking elsewhere. I don't know, in India, for example, or in other places. So whenever we start complicating the whole system, whenever we start putting a larger tax burden on the companies and on the people, that means that they will essentially become less efficient in the global perspective. And all those companies that are seeking to hire people they will be looking for people from the other companies, uh, from the other countries. And in the end of the day, that means that less Ukrainian specialists would be efficiently employed. They will get less money. They will spend less money. And the whole economy system would suffer from that. Okay, I get your point of view. Uh, so, so, somewhere I agree, somewhere no, but it's okay. <laughs> I hope that uh, sometime, uh, some someday we we'll meet in person and uh, talk about that. It's very interesting. So the last, uh, like, not serious question: uh, When the bull market will start? I think 
I can expect it to start within the next two or three years. I don't think it will start next year. I think that the whole concept that whenever we get the halving, we've got the mobile market would be wrong this cycle. I do believe in crypto. I do believe in crypto utility. It's just that fact that so far I don't see any new cool narrative. So previous bull market started with the DeFi summer. The market, before, you know, the bull market before the last bull market started with the ICOs. So like alternative to IPOs, people investing, blah, 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 this kind of stuff. Right now, I don't see anything that will, you know, ignite this new bull market. So I think it will take time. There would be a solution. It just would not be that fast. I think like two, three years from now, it is pretty reasonable to expect it to start. Okay, got you. Uh, a bit uh, not so optimistic as the other speakers uh, because they... Uh, connected it to uh, the halving, but uh, better to be yeah. uh, pessimistic and get uh, better results than uh, be optimistic and get uh, some shit, you know? <laughs> I, I, wa I want to say here that uh, the market never reacts to the viewpoint of the majority of people. So if everyone thinks that halving would boost the next bull market, the market would probably go the other way. It is the because only everybody case. everybody knows it and everybody here waits yep. it, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for having uh, have, for 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 your time. Uh, it was very interesting to hear about uh, bridges, and uh, I your presentation was uh, so good enough. So I, I uh, got the answers on, on my questions, which I wanted to to uh, to ask you. Okay. Thank uh, you so much for inviting. Thank Real you. Bye-bye.